Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would make the Psalms our heartbeat and our hope. We pray, Lord, that you would cause these truths, these realities to work their way into the grooves and crevices of our souls and hearts and emotions and instincts so that we will truly be people who know you and walk with you. And Father, we ask that you would help us to celebrate your justice and your goodness the way that the psalmist does. Father, we pray that you would cause the words of the Bible to be the words of our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Johnson read about David's reaction to the death of Absalom, his son. And that poignant scene is, is complicated. It's complicated because there's something profoundly right about a father grieving the death of a wayward son. But there's also something profoundly wrong, and that's what Joab addresses, the fact that, that people had put their lives on the line for David, and they had gone to war, they'd gone into battle for David, and now David is, in effect, mourning their victory. It's, it's a complicated scene. This morning, we're going to be looking at Psalm 9, and in Psalm 9, I think we have the undiluted praise of David for his deliverance from Absalom. And I'll, I'll tell you how we get there, how we get from Psalm 9 to Absalom in just a moment. But right now, I want to, I want to suggest that there are, there are certain analogies between the revolt of Absalom and what we learn from it and a revolution that's taking place in our culture. And the revolution that I'm talking about is this sexual revolution and this moral revolution that is making it so that something that would have been conceived as impossible, utterly unthinkable, just two decades ago, even one decade ago, is now a reality, and and we're now facing a situation where we're the bad people. We're the bad people because we want to say no to gay marriage. So I want to suggest that there are certain analogies between Absalom's revolt and our culture's revolt against what God's Word says about marriage. What are the analogies? Well, both David's royal claim to the throne and marriage are instituted by God, aren't they? A a prophet, Samuel, has anointed David as king. Prophets from Moses to Jesus himself have endorsed marriage. And and then along with this prophetic declaration, we, we look at these two institutions, the Davidic kingship and marriage, and we see that they're both they're they're good for God's people. They're engineered by God for the safety and flourishing of all people. David's kingship would have protected Israel. It would have been a blessing to the world. And and the same is true of marriage. So as we look at Psalm 9 this morning, I want to ask the question, what do we learn from Absalom's Revolt, And then I want to invite you, I think this is the way the Psalms are, are written. They're written to address a particular situation in David's life. And I'm going to suggest that in this case, uh, the situation is David responding to God striking down Absalom. That's what David is addressing. But they're written in such a way that they're general enough for the people of God to take them and apply them to their own situations. So I want to suggest three things that we're going to learn in Psalm 9, from Absalom's revolt that apply to our lives. Number one, praise and prayers are to be directed to the Lord. Praise and prayers are to be directed to the Lord. We'll look more closely at these in just a moment. Number two, judgment and destruction await the wicked. Judgment and destruction await the wicked. And number three, The Lord is the stronghold of his people. It's like Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. 
So as we, as we approach Psalm 9, I, I would invite you to, to take your bulletin, and in, there's an insert there, and I'm suggesting that there is a certain structure to Psalms 3 through 9. And you can see how the left side of this structure that this is the lower one on the page. The left side of the structure forms a kind of X shape, and the letter for an X shape in, in Greek is chi. And so this is why we refer to these as a chiasm. And I'm pointing that out because some people have uh, evidently raised the question, what is a chiasm? That's what a chiasm, it's when something forms this shape. So in, in Psalms 1 and 2, just to kind of review where we've been in the Psalms, Psalm 1 introduces this individual blessed man. And then I've argued that Psalm 2 clarifies the identity of that blessed man as the Lord's anointed against whom the nations have gathered together to throw off the yoke of not only the Lord, but also the Lord's Messiah. That's what the word anointed mean. So I think the blessed man in Psalm 1 is Israel's king, the expected king from David's line. And then in Psalm 2, the situation is clarified as the blessed man is identified as the king of Israel. And, and in Psalm 1-6... Five and six, you've got this congregation of the righteous who gather around the blessed man and they live like he does. They follow the example that he sets. Then in Psalm 2, you've got all these wicked people ranged against him. In Psalms 3 through 9, it's like we get an illustration of this. So if you look back at the superscription of Psalm 3, it says, A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. So Absalom is an example of a wicked king who's trying to throw off the kingship of the Lord's anointed and the authority of God himself. And then look, look at the superscription of Psalm 9. The superscription of Psalm 9, which I'm suggesting here corresponds to Psalm 3, says, if you're looking at the ESV like I am, to the choir master, and then you've ha- you have these words, according to Muth Laban. And um, if you've... If, if, if you study Hebrew, the word muth means death, and labain can mean of the sun. And if you're looking at the New King James translation, it actually renders this according to the tune of the death of the sun. So, so what I'm suggesting here is that in Psalm 3, you get David's prayer when Absalom revolted, and in Psalm 9, you get David's response to the death of Absalom. And it's not like the response that we saw in Samuel. The response that we saw in Samuel, there's rightness in it in that he's mourning for his his wayward son, but there's wrongness in it in that he's he's not doing justice to those who have fought for him. In Psalm 9, this is just undiluted praise to the Lord for delivering him from the wicked. There are elements, life is complicated, There are elements of both responses that are right. Psalm 9, we get one. 2 Samuel, we get the other. Between these two psalms, I think there are also points of correspondence between, say, Psalm 4 and Psalm 8. For instance, look at Psalm 4, verse 3, where where David asserts, Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. And we talked about when we were in Psalm 4 how that reference to the godly is singular. And and I think that what David is saying is, know that God has set apart this king for himself. So he's he's rebuking the wicked who are rebelling against him. And then I think that matches Psalm 8, where you have this this meditation on the Son of Man in verse 4, who has received dominion as God's king over God's realm. And and we talked about how... uh, what, what we see there when we were in those passages. So as there are correspondences between 3 and 9 and 4 and 8, so also between 5 and 7. When we were in Psalm 5, we considered the way that David is essentially asserting in that psalm, Lord, you are righteous and you hate evil and they're the wicked ones, not me. So implication, don't treat me like the wicked ones, which is what we find in Psalm 6, and then in Psalm 7, matching this, their wicked, not me, Psalm 7, David is insisting on his own innocence. And then moving out of this celebration of God's purposes and the glory of his name in Psalm 8, we come into Psalm 9 
where we have a celebration of God's justice. So I think there's a, a carefully balanced structure, an arrangement to these psalms, and also there's a movement, a progression, where in Psalm 8, David says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then in Psalm 9, he responds to the manifestation of God's justice against the wicked. So, um, as we come to Psalm 9, I think this is the broader context of the psalm. And I think that in this psalm, we're finding, we're having David's response to the demise of Absalom. Now, this psalm, Psalm 9... Um, is, is arranged in 10 two-verse units. So if you're, again, if you're looking at the ESV like I am, you can see how they've put verses 1 and 2 together, and then there's a kind of space between the end of verse 2 and verse 3. And, and you can note how that kind of thing continues all the way through the psalm. There are these 10 two-verse units, and in the same way that I think there's a chiastic structure to Psalms 3 through 9, I think there's also a chiastic structure to Psalm 9 itself. And what I want to do is I want to take the, the beginning part and the matching end part. And then the second part and the second to last part. And I want to work through the psalm that way. And as we go through the psalm that way, we're going to see the three things that I suggested we would learn from Absalom's revolt. We're going to see praise in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and then a prayer in chapter 9, verses 19 and 20. And then we'll see the judgment and the destruction of the wicked in the second part and the second to last part. And then in the very middle of the whole thing, we will see that the Lord is the stronghold of his people. So I would invite you now to look with me at Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2, where we see the praise the praise that David offers to the Lord in response to this deliverance. So look with me at Psalm 9. He says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Everything in him is gratitude to God. We all, every last one of us, owe this response to God All the time. This is how we should constantly be responding to the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. One of one of the most devastating aspects of our sinfulness is the way that we fail to love the Lord our God with all our hearts all the time. We we are constantly failing at this, at giving thanks. We owe him this kind of gratitude. But here, David, he, he sees the demise of Absalom, and he thanks God with his whole heart. He says there in, in the rest of verse 1, I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. So what he's going to do now is he's going to celebrate God's mighty acts on his behalf. And, and particularly, what he's going to do is celebrate the way that God brought the rebellion to nothing, and we'll see that in verses 3 through 6 when we, when we get there. Look first here at verse 2. He says, I will be glad and exult in you. And I would invite you to consider David's situation. David's dealing with a situation where his child rebelled against him, tried to seize his throne. This was a, a failure, ultimately, of David. Not to parent this child better. And then it was rebellion of Absalom to go against the Lord himself and the Lord's anointed. This is a devastating situation. David can't exult in himself and his performance. He can't exult even in the way that the people fought for him. Because the people went over to Absalom. David doesn't have anything but the Lord to exult in. And I would encourage you to plead with the Lord to write these words on your heart so that when whatever it is in your life, I don't know what it's going to be in your life, but we're all going to find ourselves in situations where we don't have anything else to exult in but the Lord. And this is how we want to respond. This is how we want to respond. Because he is enough. 
I will be glad and exult in you. And then in verse 2, at the end of the verse, he says, I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. This is almost exactly what we had in 717 at the end, where he said, I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. And the word that is rendered sing praise here, as we noted when we were in Psalm 7, is a word that's that's the verbal form of the noun that we we translate psalm. So so if this this composition here in Psalm 9 is a psalm, what David is in essence saying is, I will psalm your name, O Most High. And as I reflected on what this means, in light of him just saying, I will recount all of your wonderful deeds, it's as though David is saying, I am going to put in poetic form a celebration of the epic tale of the way that God has delivered me. And so if if the Greeks have the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Romans have the Aeneid, the Hebrews have the Psalms as the, the poetic celebration of God's mighty acts of deliverance on their behalf. And whereas the Greeks and the Romans are seeing these demonic heroes, demonically inspired falsehoods, the Hebrews are singing these true stories of what God does, the living God. I will sing praise. I will psalm your name, O Most High. There's the praise. Now look down at the plea in verses 19 and 20. He's going to, in the body of this psalm, David is going to talk about what God has done for him in the defeat of Absalom's rebellion as something that's already happened. And then at the end of this psalm, look at verse 19. Arise, O Lord. Now, you see what he's doing? He's, He's praising God for the deliverance. Then he's going to recount the deliverance. Now what's he going to do? He's going to call on the Lord to arise to do more like this. This indicates that the experience that's recounted in this psalm is pointing forward to more of the same in the future. David is expecting a repetition of this pattern of events that's happened in his own life with Absalom in the future. Arise, he says, O Lord. Let not man prevail. What would it look like for man to prevail? Well, in the case of Absalom's rebellion... If Absalom could decide, well, this God, Yahweh, has tried to make my father king, but I think I'll throw off that moral order. I think I'll do away with that anointing, and I'll make myself king. That would be for man to prevail over God and over God's purposes in the world. What would it be for man to prevail today? Well, hypothetically, if a society were to decide, well, God created these humans, male and female, but we're going to disregard that now. We're not not going to recognize this thing that is assigned to people at birth as though there's no relationship between your biology and your, your sexuality. We're not going to recognize. And God instituted this marriage in the garden, and we're just not going to recognize that anymore. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. We could also apply this to Jesus, right? They took God's king and crucified him. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. What's he do? He raises him from the dead. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to apply also to the end of all things when the Lord Jesus comes and man will not prevail. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Verse 19, let the nations be judged before you. Um, it's interesting. Back in verse 3, uh, it says, When my enemies turn back, Psalm 9, verse 3, they stumble and perish before your presence. And, and the, the, the construction here in nine nineteen is very similar. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged. We could render this in your presence. So what has happened in, in the case of Absalom that David is celebrating in Psalm 9 David is saying, do this in the future, Lord, with all the nations. Take it global. Put them in fear, verse 20. Let the nations know that they are but men, Selah. 
I don't, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this, but I've had these vivid dreams. I had one this week. I had this vivid dream that I awakened from so relieved that my life was not as I had dreamed it was. And, and, and th- this, this dream had to do with something else, but, but I've had other dreams where, where it's one of these situations where I'm guilty. I- I'm guilty, and I'm, I'm, the verdict is rendered, and I am being sent away to prison, and life as I have known it is over, and there is no way to appeal, and I'm, I'm in the wrong. What I'm suggesting here is Hopefully, you've had an experience that has put the fear of God into you. And that's what David is talking about here. Let, when he says, put them in fear, he's saying, God, bring into their consciousness this awareness of their guilt and of the weight of your wrath that is due to them. Let the nations know that they are but Men, they're not God. They're not going to overthrow you. They stand guilty before you. That's what David is appealing for the Lord to do, and that's a good thing for people to experience. This sense that everything is known, everything we've denied or made excuses for or thought was hidden, it's all open and revealed. This is what David is is calling the Lord to do for people because this is what brings people to repentance. When you know you're guilty, there's no way to hide, and God is going to be a just judge, this is when you flee for mercy to the Lord Jesus. And if if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you're not trusting in Jesus, we would urge you to do this. We would urge you not to make any more excuses. If you're here and you're a believer and you know that there is an ongoing issue in your life and you know that that you have not yet taken the radical steps that you need to to deal with this, we would plead with you to take those steps. Do what needs to be done. David praises God for deliverance in verses 1 and 2. Then he pleads with God to make it global in 9, 19, and 20. Those are the first and the last parts. The second and the second to last parts deal with judgment and destruction. So we see the judgment and destruction in verses 3 through 6, and then again in verses 15 through 18. You can follow along in your bulletin. You've got the structure there if you'd like to look at it. Look at at verse 3. David says, When my enemies turn back, They stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving judgment. You have rebuked the nations. So so the, the drift of this, the idea that God is rebuking the nations, and then apparently in response in verse 3, the enemies are turning back and stumbling. It's as though God himself has shown up. God has shown up. He's made himself known. He's revealed himself. And then in verse verse 5 there, when it says, you have rebuked the nations, that particular word carries connotations of insulting speech. And it's not the same word that's used in Psalm 2, but it's the same image. When Psalm 2 says, he who sits in the heavens laughs, Verse 4, the Lord holds them in derision. Verse 5, then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. It's like the Lord is sitting up in heaven mocking his enemies. And that's what David is envisioning here. He's rebuked the nations, verse 5. And in response, verse 3, they can only turn back and flee. And as they turn to go, they stumble. And then they perish. And that's a word we've seen before, isn't it? Psalm 1, verse 6, the way of the wicked will perish. Psalm 2, verse 12, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Psalm 9 is an outworking of what was said would happen in, in, verses, in, in Psalms 1 and 2. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. Let me encourage you to take heart. 
no matter what happens in your life, no matter what you face, and, and I don't know what it's going to come to, but um, maybe you read on Denny's blog about this, this couple. I think, they were, I think they had a bakery, and it was shut down because they refused to bake a cake for a gay wedding. And, um, and then the guy has, has taken a, a job as a garbage collector. He's, you know, picking up trash now. And, um, and he's, now, now they've, the, the government has not only shut down their business, they've imposed a $150,000 fine on this family. And, and there was a GoFundMe campaign to raise money, you know, for people to pay this. Well, uh, the activists started, uh, you know, crying out about this, and uh, they shut down the GoFundMe campaign. So now there's another another website where they're trying to raise this hundred and fifty. I mean, that's that's a pretty significant amount of money, isn't it? Hundred fifty thousand. Could you pay that? Um, I wouldn't want to have to pay that. Um, I don't know what it's going to come to, but I do know this: the Lord's going to show up. The Lord is going to show up, and the enemies are going to turn back and stumble and perish before His presence. Verse four. For you have maintained my just cause. In, in David's case, the just cause is he's the rightful king of Israel. And the Lord is defending him against Absalom. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. There's an intrinsic connection between God's throne and his judgment. He's maintaining David's just cause. Verse 5, you rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked Perish. There's that word again. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. So often in the Bible, from Genesis 11 forward, all over the place in the Bible, the wicked are trying to make a name for themselves. And what the scriptures teach is the quickest way to be forgotten is to rebel against the Lord. The quickest way to have your name blotted out forever is to take up arms against the Lord and his anointed. Verse 6, the enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. So, so you can see the smoldering, smoking, smoking ruins of a city that has been devastated by the wrath of God. That's the, the image there. Their cities you rooted out. And the, the idea of the cities being rooted out, it's sort of the opposite of a tree that's planted by streams of water. And I think that... That imagery is supposed to work together there. Their, their, their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. So there's judgment and destruction there in verses 3 through 6. There's judgment and destruction in verses uh, 15. Let me get this right. Yeah, 15 through 18. So look with me at verse 15 where David says here, the nations have sunk in the pit that they made. And this ought to, if, if you've been with us as we've gone through the Psalms, this ought to st- sound familiar. Because we saw this in chapter 5, when, when David had prayed in, in Psalm 5, verse 10, let them fall by their own counsels. And then we saw it again in chapter 7, when David described the way in verse 15, the wicked man makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head. Now here in 9.15, he says, the nations have sunk in the pit that they made. In the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. Now look at David's explanation of this in verse 16. The Lord has made himself known. This is God revealing himself. When, When wicked people set snares and traps for others that wind up closing upon themselves. This is God revealing himself. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. Look at the end of verse 16. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. God reveals himself when wicked people turn out to be those who suffer most from their own sinful choices and actions. Now think about what we saw in verses 3 through 6 and what we see here in verses 15 through 18. In verses 3 through 6, the wicked suffer God's direct personal displeasure. 
in verses 15 through 18, they find, they discover that this world was not created as a place where evil is going to flourish. That's not the way that God made the world. God set this up as a world in which righteousness is going to flourish. And God didn't make this world as a place where if people are clever enough and if they build their schemes thoroughly enough, they will find themselves in some wicked man's paradise. That's not the way this world is going to work. No, the traps are going to snap shut on their own feet. They are going to fall in their own pits. The weapons of the wicked will backfire. And those trying to do the shooting are going to be the ones getting shot. Yahweh makes himself known. People suffer the consequences of their own evil. This is a great reason to repent. This is great, great encouragement to seek to walk with the Lord. So judgment and destruction await the wicked. Look at the end of verse 16. Hegeon, Selah. That word Hegeon, it's, it's, it's actually translated in Psalm 19. If, if, if you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. Psalm 19, let the words of my mouth and the meditation, that's the word Hegeon. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It's like the psalmist is saying, meditate, Selah. Look at, look at the outcome of the wicked and meditate on it. Learn from it. Selah. So we see judgment and destruction. Look at verses 17 and 18. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. So the wicked are going to be punished. They're not going to some alternative paradise. They're going to Sheol. The nations that forgot God, they're not going to succeed in creating their alternative reality. The hope of the poor will not perish forever. This, this hope of the poor, this communicates this idea that the poor, the, the afflicted, they've been crying out to the Lord for deliverance against this wicked oppression. And that's a, a natural segue to the, the, the heart of this psalm, which is in verses 7 through 14 where we see that the Lord is our stronghold. So, so there's a, I think that at the, at the center of this psalm here in verses 7 through 14, this is, this is what the psalmist has set up to be focused on. That's why there's this chiastic structure. It's to draw attention to what's in the middle, and that's why we're treating it last here. Um, verse 6 talked about how the enemy came to everlasting ruins and the memory of them perished. And then look at the contrast in verse 7. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. And, and this again picks up that idea from Psalm 2 4, the one who sits in the heavens. The Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. Again, that connection between God's authority as king and his right to judge. God made us. He has the right to judge us. He is king, and he will judge from that throne. How will he judge? Verse 8, he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. Righteousness and uprightness, these are synonyms, and they both communicate what the Scriptures teach. God is going to judge the world in accordance with the commands and prohibitions and instructions and and teachings that we find in the Bible. That's a, that's a bad piece of news for the wicked, but it's good news for the righteous. And, and the good news is what we see picked up in verse 9, where David says, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. In David's own case, in his own life, it was oppressive to him for Absalom to seize uh, the, 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 the throne of the kingdom to drive his father out of the city and even to take David's own wives and all of David's possessions and, and just sort of uh, commandeer all of that for himself. That was oppressive. In the life of the ordinary Israelite, there wasn't supposed to be any oppression in Israel. But people are wicked 
And so you have oppression in ancient Israel. And the oppressed, they're, they're crying out to the Lord for del- deliverance. And David is saying the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. This word that's, that's rendered trouble here, it gets at the idea of destitution. You, you, don't, you don't have means, you don't have resources, you, you don't have connections that you can appeal to. You're, you're bankrupt, and the Lord is your stronghold. David continues in verse 10, And those who know your name put their trust in you. What is it to know the name of the Lord? It's to know his reputation. It's to know what kind of God he is. It's to know that he's gracious and compassionate and just and fair. And if you know his name, you put your trust in him. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. God is faithful to what he said, and he's faithful to his people. And then verse 11, sing praises to the Lord. And here it is again, psalm the Lord. That's what David is saying. Psalm him, psalm Yahweh, who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Verse 12, for he who avenges blood is mindful of them. Uh, this, this could be rendered, he who seeks blood. And this, this language here in verse 12 of Psalm 9, it picks up on Genesis 9, 5, where, where the Lord had said to Noah, if anyone sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for the Lord will avenge the blood of the same, slain. It's the Lord will seek the blood of the slain. And so what David is saying is, what God said in Genesis 9 is true. God is going to bring justice for those who are wrongfully murdered. He who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Who is like the Lord our God? He, you know, some people make this comment sometimes. God helps those who help themselves. That's not what this passage teaches. This passage teaches that he does not help those who help themselves. He he helps those who can't help themselves. He helps those who can't help him. These are needy people. These, These are not people who can defend him or enrich him or contribute to him in any way. God helps those who can't defend their borders. God helps those who can't fund a security force, who can't devise a clever strategy to entrap intruders. God helps those who can't establish peace through a demonstration of their own strength. The Lord is their stronghold because they have no other fortress, no other help, no other refuge. And if everything else has failed you, if everything else you've tried hasn't worked, you should seek the Lord. I love, I love what Heath put in his book, uh, Finally Free. There is no battle so, so hot, so severe, that the Lord Jesus can't win it. That's true. There is no struggle you face that is stronger than the Lord Jesus. Why does God do this? Well, God does this because those helped by him in this way recognize what he has done for, for, for them. And, and David responds the way that we should respond with, with these epic celebrations in poetic form of God's faithfulness to his word and his people. Celebrations of God's superior wisdom and strategic genius. Celebrations of God's justice against the wicked. So in Psalms 3 through 9, we move through this pattern again, don't we? David starts out being afflicted by Absalom, and and he suffers. And then he comes to confidence in Psalm 8, celebrating the name of the Lord in all the earth, and then vindication in Psalm 9. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about in Luke 24 when he said, was it not necessary for the Christ first to suffer and then to enter into his glory? 
That's the pattern that we see in David's life. That's the pattern that we see in Jesus' life. That's the pattern, the example that he left us that we should follow in his steps. Interestingly, um, we, we were in John recently, and you may remember in John 18, verse 6, when, when they come to arrest Jesus, this great scene, and, and, and Jesus comes out to them and he says, Who do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am. And the Bible says in John 18, 6, that they drew back and fell to the ground. John doesn't quote the Greek translation of Psalm 9-3, but I think he's alluding to that passage. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. I think John maybe has that verse in mind when he shows the enemies of the Lord Jesus who have come to arrest him turning back and falling to the ground. The deliverance of David from Absalom was a visitation of God's justice. Jesus spoke of the hour of his crucifixion as the judgment of this world, John 12, 31. And those patterns of history in David's life, at the cross, are going to be, those patterns are going to be fulfilled and consummated when what John read earlier in this passage happens. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Let's pray. Father, we want to be those who marvel at the Lord Jesus. We want to be those who celebrate the justice of the righteousness, the uprightness. And so, Lord, we pray that as the world seems to fall apart and as as people begin to demand to know whether we are on the right side of history or not, Lord, we pray that you'd make us faithful, faithful to you, faithful to what you've instituted in the world, faithful to the king from the line of David, faithful to the way that the Davidic kingship points to the salvation in Jesus, and faithful to the way that marriage points to the salvation in Jesus. Lord, make us faithful to the gospel so that when you come, we will not be driven from your presence, but welcomed in. And Father, I pray I pray particularly, Lord, that you would help us to turn from sin, to walk with you, to take whatever steps are necessary to be pleasing to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.